Excellent. So good morning, Ani, Boju, everyone, welcome. Um, and thank you for joining us today. We're really grateful that you took time out of your day to be here for this very important conversation. Um, so this is an RBC Gandoswan Trail speaker series uh, with Russ Yabo. We're really grateful to uh, be hearing from this Laurentian alumni today. I would like to begin by honoring the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people on which most of us are situated today. The territories of the Atikmikshin and Anishinaabek one of the First Nations, as well as the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850. Um, because we're in a Zoom call, I think it's also important to recognize and honor all the, of the traditional territories on which our viewers are situated. We are grateful for all of these lands and to the nations which nurture and care for these territories. We must respect and privilege these relationships above all else. So we're here today for the RBC Gandoswan Trail Speaker Series, which was created um, to empower, motivate, inspire, and inform the community of Laurentian University, inclusive of students, faculty, staff, um, in their educational growth. The Gandoswan Trail Series was renamed to uh, acknowledge a, a contribution from the Royal Bank of Canada in the construction of our Indigenous Sharing and Learning Centre. So although we're not physically in that space, uh, we're, we're grateful to have um, a home to go back to very shortly, hopefully. The RBC Ngadosno Trail Speaker Series has the mandate to bring forth awareness and educate society on the successes, challenges, and ongoing evolution of First Peoples, Métis, Inuit nations in Canada. The word in Gadaswin translates to one who is learned and captures the essence of this series. And our guest today um, definitely, definitely fits the criteria. Um, so as I said, our special guest is Russ Diabo, who is a member of the Mohawk Nation of Kanawage and a valued alumni of Laurentian University. Russ has a long history of uh, experience working as a land defender, for example, during the Oka crisis and the standoff in Wounded of 1973. He's also experienced in politics. He was a part of the National Indian Brotherhood in the Parliamentary Liaison Unit and took part in advocating for the Indigenous environmental issues at the United Nations. An avid educator throughout his work, Russ provides lectures, articles, and videos in which he addresses topics of Aboriginal and treaty rights and continues to critically examine policy development and implementation to advocate for Indigenous self-determination. We are very grateful to hear from such a, a forward thinker uh, and look forward to hearing from Russ on the topic of the failure of the National Reconciliation Plan, how to develop real Indigenous self-determination involving land back. So thank you again for joining us. Um, we're very grateful to hear from you. And I think these conversations are very much relevant um, in, in the current era. I'll pass it over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um... So I have um, prepared a PowerPoint and I apologize in advance for the number of slides, but it's a huge topic that I'm covering, actually two topics, because I'm dealing with the, um, the uh, you know, the failure of the, uh, the Trudeau government's uh, reconciliation plan and, um, and um, how you go about dealing with taking land back through self-determination plans. So, um, Oops. Sorry, I'm, I don't have my uh, screen share on. I will go to that. Still learning this Zoom, Zoom call stuff. <laughs> everybody see that yes okay good okay so <clears throat> as stated uh, the topic that i'm going to uh, cover is trudeau government's failed uh, national reconciliation plan from when they got in elected into power in 2015 right through to today and what's going on today um but also in response i want to talk about taking land back through self-determination plans so in terms of my presentation, I first want to get into some context or background on um, self-government versus self-determination. And then I want to talk about the reconciliation promises from the, the Liberal government and the reconciliation plan they've been pursuing and what the status of that plan is today. 
And then I want to conclude about the development of First Nations uh, self-determination and territorial plans in response to that reconciliation plan of the, uh, the federal government. First thing we have to acknowledge is that um, um, we're dealing with the legacy of Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau and, and Jean Chrétien. Uh, Jean Chrétien was Minister of Indian Affairs in 1969 when they proposed you know, the termination of uh, Indian status and rights. Um, and um, <clears throat> he went on to become Justice Minister and, uh, and Prime Minister. So Jean Chrétien has had a lot to do with what we're dealing with today as did Pierre Trudeau. The, the first thing I also wanna say is that the federal government co-ops terminology. Um, in the 1990s, there was a public relations firm called Continental Golan Harris that advised the federal government and gave them a strategic communication strategy. And uh, successive governments seemed to have kind of followed that advice, including the Trudeau government. And in my opinion, the communication strategy is really only a euphemism for what would be called co propaganda. Um, the document from Continental Gold and Harris says the central objective of the communications component <clears throat> would be to control the information. And, uh, you know, it, it also advises that the government must at all times control the dialogue and it must be seen as the primary information source. That way they can force, force all opposing parties into a response position, meaning First Nations. Uh, this this uh, document was prepared in response to the Grand Council decrees of Quebec, who were taking the federal government to court for a failure to implement the James Bay Agreement of 1975. So that's that was the context that this advice was given in. But you know, it's it's been used broadly. And they also recommended the formation of a, a committee. Um, called a special words and tactics committee to surround the minister uh, in, in the context of the document, it was to respond to any statements the Grand Council of Decrees might make regarding their positions and then negotiations or litigation. But, you know, from what I've seen, they've used special words and tactics consistently uh, on other issues. Um, so I think it's important to realize that self-government is different than self-determination. But again, you know, the, the government tends to, to use these terms as they, they want to portray them. And really what we're, we're dealing with, uh, and this again goes to Pierre Trudeau and Jean Chrétien negotiating the Constitution Act 1982, which became law on April 17th of 1982 when the Queen signed it into law. Um, the important to know, the thing to know about the Constitution Act 1982 is Section 35 uh, was only included in the Constitution due to pressure from Aboriginal groups and public support. And even Prime Minister Justin Trudeau admitted that his father uh, did not want to include that into the Constitution Act uh, 1982. Uh, when it was first introduced in the Constitution, it said we, we hereby recognize and affirm Aboriginal treaty rights of Aboriginal peoples. But it was the governments of Alberta and uh, Saskatchewan that wanted that clause removed. And so it was removed. And um, that's when the pressure was put on the federal government to reinsert it. But when they reinserted it, Section 35 reads as it does today, that the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of Aboriginal peoples are hereby recognized and affirmed. And um, at the time, I remember um, Justice Minister Jean Chrétien saying, oh, it's because they exist. But clearly, in retrospect, it was clearly intended to limit future interpretations of Section 35 by the courts. Uh, and the courts have said that it's, it's rights that existed at the time the Constitution became law on April 17th, 1982 because before that, the government's position is in Canadian law that they could unilaterally extinguish rights up to this point. But also included in um, section, uh, in um, the Constitution Act 1982 was section 37. And that, that provided for that they had to have a first minister's constitutional conference on Aboriginal matters one year once the, um, the Constitution was proclaimed into law. <clears throat> 
1982. So in 1983, there was a constitutional amendment proclamation. And uh, originally section 37, the purpose of those meetings, the first minister's conferences was to identify and define what Aboriginal treaty rights means in section 35 of the constitution. But they held that um, first minister's conference in 1983 and there were representatives of four national Aboriginal organizations representing First Nations, the Inuit and the Métis uh, at the table, along with the First Ministers, which was the Prime Minister flanked by his Justice and Indian Affairs Ministers and the Provincial Premiers and the Territorial Leaders. So that was who was at the table at these First Ministers conferences. Um, in the uh, Constitutional Amendment from 1983, um, it was agreed that they would amend section 35 uh, 1 to include section 3, where they created a new category of treaties called land claims agreements, now called modern treaties, and section 4 confirming that Aboriginal and treaty rights are guaranteed equally to men and women. Because at that 1983 constitutional conference, um, there was a lot of um, the government of Quebec gave its seat up to uh, Native women's organizations to be able to talk about Section 12.1b and the discrimination in the Indian Act, um, which existed up to 1985. Um, but it was a gender discrimination where women would lose their status, <clears throat> you know, if they married a non uh, a non status person. And also that 1983 constitutional amendment said there will be further first ministers conferences on Aboriginal matters um, in 1984, 1985 and 1987. And of course, uh, in 1984, there was a federal election. So in 1985 and 1987, the chair, uh, the chair shifted over to Brian Moroni as prime minister instead of uh, Pierre Trudeau. So these 1980s First Ministers Conferences on Aboriginal Matters, uh, in that 1983 uh, amendment, they changed the Section 37 process from, you know, identifying and defining what rights would be included in the Constitution, like the meaning of Aboriginal treaty rights, uh, to discussing Aboriginal matters that directly affect the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. Because there was a list of items, Aboriginal title, treaties, rights of Métis, land, but you know, despite all these agenda items, the, folk, the, the issue that became dominant was whether the right to self-government was an inherent right or a contingent conditional right, depending on getting uh, agreements with the federal and provincial governments. And the four national Aboriginal organizations went around and around. They wouldn't accept the proposals from the Crown governments to enter into a process of negotiation that would lead to recognition of self-government. So in 1987, that process, the Section 37 process, ended without any agreement. So Section 35, the meaning of that was supposed to be a political agreement, you know, with the national Aboriginal organizations. Um, and so that's why, in my opinion, I think Section 35 is unfinished business because there was no political agreement on that. <clears throat> because in, starting in 1990, the Supreme Court of Canada took over to define Section 35 through case law. And so for the past, over the past 30 years, they've been laying out legal, um, legal uh, principles and legal tests, which if you want to assert you have Section 35 rights, then you have to collect the evidence to meet. I'll get into more of that. Um, the Peroni government, um, you know, with the Charlottetown Accord in 1982, that was their last attempt to try and do a constitutional reform. Um, to, which included the recognition of the inherent right to self-government, but a national referendum rejected the Charlottetown Accord. So in 1993, um, there was a federal election and uh, a majority liberal government was elected, headed up by Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. And in the 1993 Liberal Red Book promise, um, the government, the liberals promised that a liberal government would act on the premise that the inherent right to self-government is an existing Aboriginal treaty right within the meaning of Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982. And at the time they said it was consistent with what the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples had set out in its interim report on self-government, uh, which was released in 1992. But uh, really it, it's much different. If you look at that document, you'll see that the, uh, the Liberals took a different approach because in 1995, 
they uh, unilaterally imposed the government of Canada's approach to implementation of the inherent right and the negotiation of self-government, which they called their inherent right policy. <clears throat> but um, but it, it's an anything but inherent right, as I'll explain here. The federal definition under that policy of the inherent right to self <coughs> excuse me. The definition of the inherent right to self-government, <clears throat> which is still in place today, this policy, is in the policy, the federal government says it will recognize that section 35 includes the inherent right of self-government, but the policy then limits and restricts the nature and scope of the right through its policy. And it wants to get First Nations consent to a narrow definition of rights by negotiating under the policy. And the policy also requires that there's a provincial role in matters that affect provincial governments, you know, their section 92 uh, powers under the constitution and they allow a provincial veto in any matters, you know, like um, um, child welfare, uh, lands and resources, uh, health, education, those are all matters of provincial jurisdiction. So if you look at uh, any agreements, it requires a provincial government to agree. Canada's definition of inherent are matters that are internal and integral to the culture of a First Nation. Um, you know, internal governance, reserve lands, administration, delivery of services, culture. But Canada under the policy still retains control by defining the limits to what can be negotiated under each heading, even though it's recognized as inherent. And there are areas where Canada will not recognize an, any inherent right, but they will uh, delegate and the delegate of First Nations recognize that the federal government has paramount authority over taxation, trade and commerce, justice, gaming, fisheries, and other matters of national interest. And again, the provinces get vetoes in their areas for any subjects that, that uh, touch on their jurisdiction. What's non-negotiable, it's set, set out in that self-government policy, is the matter of self-determination, Extinguishment in terra nullius, you know, vacant lands, sovereignty, international treaty making, international trade, import, export, trade and commerce, criminal law, and very importantly, fiscal policy is non-negotiable. The federal government keeps control of that. So in discussions, negotiations, and legislation right up to today, from 1995 to today, the federal inherent right policy is being played, applied by Canada at every discussion and negotiation table across the country. Uh, Canada's wow. intentions is to use these negotiations to get First Nations consent, uh, as I've said, to a narrow definition on the nature and scope of Aboriginal treaty rights. Because remember, um, this wasn't defined in Section 35 in those talks in the 1980s, and the Supreme Court of Canada has not ruled on whether self-government's an Aboriginal right or not. So this policy is, is the policy the government states its position on negotiating self-government. And in the process of negotiations, fiscal resources are capped or reduced, and the federal government abandons responsibility to, to ensure that the needs are met without assuring adequate revenues for First Nations. Because you become a self-governing group uh, within the terms and conditions of the agreements you sign, accepting these preconditions. And in terms of federal legislation over Indians, First Nations, and now Indigenous peoples, um, the federal government continues interference by legislating in areas that even Canada admits are internal to First Nations and integral to their culture. Uh, for example, elections, lands, definition of the band, now child and family services and languages. And, um, you know, they want to modify the legislative base to facilitate it, what they call inherent right negotiations. Um, but really it's to consolidate the ultimate control of the ministers and they use the legislation to limit the nature and scope of the right and First Nations consent when they opt into legislation. For example, the, the Indigenous Child and Family Services Act Bill 92. Um, many opposed that, um, many supported it, but many opposed that and now they're negotiating agreements under it. So that's an example of, of consenting to basically unilaterally imposed federal legislation. So when the, when the Trudeau government was elected in in 2015, um, they made a number of promises 
the I haven't included them all, but the key promises they made in 2015 was that they would engage in a new nation to nation process. They would develop in full partnership with First Nations and National Reconciliation Framework. They'd enact all 94 Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action, and they would adopt the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. They also said they would lift the 2% cap on First Nations funding, which was put in place in 1995 by a Liberal government under Jean Chrétien by Finance Minister Paul Martin. And um, so they promised to lift that cap, which had been in place, like I said, since 1995 and did not keep pace with the population growth or rate of inflation. Um, they also promised to do a full review of federal law and policy in full partnership with First Nations. And they also promised to establish an Indigenous Missing Woman and Girls Inquiry. Um, there were other promises too, but these were some of the, the main, uh, the large ones. So the reconciliation plan really started in 2016 um, until today. Um, so I can say from my experience um, in the 1993 federal election as vice president of policy for the Aboriginal Liberal Commission, because I was in vice president of policy from 1990 to 94, um, and I've observed this, that when a federal political party forms government, it falls to the bureaucracy to turn the election promises into a plan. And uh, in January 2016, uh, while Prime Minister Trudeau was in Davos, Switzerland, he issued a press release appointing Michael Warnick as clerk of the Privy Council. And Michael Warnick was Stephen Harper's Deputy Minister of Indian Affairs for almost 10 years. Um, but then he became the top bureaucrat in Ottawa um, by Jacques, uh, sorry, Freudian slip, Pierre Trudeau, Justin Trudeau's appointment. And in 2016, the Trudeau government also gave, after appointing Michael Warnick, they gave qualified support for the UN Declaration. Uh, I know at the time they, they stated, Carolyn Bennett stated to the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous uh, Issues at the United Nations that Canada gave unqualified support uh, to the UN Declaration. But in her next sentence, she said in accordance with the Canadian Constitution, which is a qualification. And in December 2016, uh, Prime Minister uh, Trudeau announced a two-track approach um, to Indigenous uh, reconciliation using the three national Indigenous organizations and the three national Indigenous leaders um, of the First Nations, the Métis and the Inuit. <clears throat> and in, in June 2017, the Trudeau government issued 10 principles for Indigenous relationships, which reinforced the assumed crown sovereignty and territorial integrity through Canada's constitutional framework. And um, that's consistent with Article 46 of the UN Declaration, which, um, you know, basically interprets the UN Declaration to say it cannot be interpreted to challenge the state sovereignty or territorial integrity of, of a state. Um, people should be aware of that, that, that that is a major concern. A lot of people talk about the uh, Premiers and that talk about the, the veto, they're concerned about the veto, but they don't talk about Article 46, which basically gives um, you know, the federal government a blank check. So these 10 principles, I encourage everybody to unpack them. You can look at them yourselves. It talks about cooperative federalism and distinct, distinct uh, orders of government and that, but when you, when you break it down, like I said, it really just reinforces crown sovereignty and domination over uh, First Nations. It interprets basically Section 35 to, um, to implement that inherent right policy. So there was never any real analysis. Certainly AFN did not issue any, the Assembly of First Nations did not issue any public analysis of uh, the 10 principles which were unilaterally issued uh, by Jody Wilson-Raybould, the justice minister at the time. But also there was no analysis of dissolving the Department of Indian Affairs and Northern Development and creating two new indigenous departments. Um, there was no analysis of, of the implication of changes to the machinery of government and the implications, which is still going on. Um, when they created the Indigenous Crown Relations Department and the Indigenous Services Department, you know, headed up by Minister Carolyn Bennett and uh, Minister Mark Miller. Now this two-track reconciliation plan 
in my estimation, involves the old constitution and the new constitution. So under the old constitution, the British North America Act, now called the Constitution Act 1982, section 9124 is the colonial authority that the federal government has um, to have exclusive legislative authority over Indians and lands reserved for Indians. So that's the authority they used to create the Indian Act in 1876 and other Indian and First Nations and now indigenous legislation that they've, they've adopted. And um, they, in 2019, in an omnibus bill, 850 page bill, they buried the legislation to create these two new departments and to dissolve the Department of Indian Affairs in this huge omnibus bill. Uh, and that became law last year. Before that, they were using an order of council from cabinet from 2017 on to create two new ministers and to start the process of creating these two new departments. Um, so that's track one is using section 9124, the Constitution Act 1867. Basically, you know, the on reserve program and service delivery system is all under 9124. Section 35, you know, they've used over the past you know, almost 30 years, they've been negotiating the self-government and land claims policies to interpret um, Section 35. They have what they call a Section 35 policy framework for negotiations. And really that that's, those are unilateral policies that interpret what recognition of Aboriginal treaty rights means. So they weaponized recognition um, to, you know, be connected to federal definitions of Aboriginal treaty rights. And also the, the Supreme Court of Canada's legal tests and principles uh, that they've laid out. So that's the negotiation framework that First Nations have to go into if they wanna get out of the Indian Act. Um, both, both indigenous departments use these definitions. These are new. Uh, indigenous governing body means a council, government or other entity that is authorized to act on behalf of an indigenous group, community or people that holds the rights recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act. Now, that's that's to cover the transition in their two-track approach from um, 9124 to Section 35. So an Indigenous governing, governing body means a council, so that's like a band council under the Indian Act. Government means um, an Indigenous government, you know, which you have to either have an agreement with the federal government or accept legislation federal legislation to be recognized as an Indigenous government, but they're also including Métis and Inuit in this. So it's a pan-Indigenous approach. And um, ind Indigenous organization, you know, just means an Indigenous governing body or any other entity that represents the interests of an Indigenous group and its members. For example, an Indigenous child and family services body under section, uh, I mean, sorry, under uh, Bill 92. And of course, Indigenous Peoples has a meaning in Section 35 of the Constitution, which means Indians, Inuit, and Métis. So that's, they're, they're um, using that definition of Indigenous Peoples, not an international definition. It's a Canadian domestic definition that they're using. So the, the mandate of the Minister of Indigenous Services, Mark Miller, is to ensure that services are delivered to Indigenous individuals and Indigenous governing bodies in the area of child and family services education, health, social development, economic development, housing, infrastructure, emergency, emergency management and governance. And again, that's for, you know, on reserve Indian Act bands um, that are getting programs and services until they sign Section 35 agreements, which is where the minister, the mandate of the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations comes in. Uh, Carolyn Bennett has the leadership role for uh, whole of government approach with Canada in terms of affirmation and implementation of rights of Indigenous peoples, recognized and affirmed by the Constitution Act, you know, 1982, Section 35, the implementation of treaties and agreements. But remember what I said, that the government's policies define what, what uh, rights are recognized and affirmed. So they're, they're limiting the meaning of you know, what the rights in Section 35 are through policy and negotiations and legislation, which goes to the negotiating of treaties and other agreements to advance self-determination. So when they're talking about negotiating treaties, they're talking about what they call modern treaties or land claims agreements. 
with the existing treaties, the original treaties, pre-confederation treaties, uh, numbered treaties. Um, they want those treaties to be implemented through the inherent right policy. Um, they stated that in the inherent right policy itself. Um, Minister Bennett also has the role of advancing what they call reconciliation, their definition of it in collaboration with Indigenous peoples, meaning First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, through renewed nation to nation, government to government, and Inuit crown relationships. And I've created this chart to kind of show how it works. It's kind of a conveyor belt kind of thing where um, on the left hand side under the Department of Indigenous Services, you have Indian Act bands. Um, they basically, in some regions of Canada, they get three options um, to go beyond the Indian Act. Um, you know, where there aren't any um, historic land treaties, there's three options. Where there are historic land uh, treaties, there's two options. Um, and they've got two fiscal policies to facilitate this. For Indian Act bands, they have a 10 year or less grant, a comprehensive funding agreement. Um, um, and this is to help facilitate, you know, the, the administrative and financial capacity of Indian Act bands so they can sign Section 35 agreements. And uh, at the bottom, you can see the modern treaty comprehensive claims final agreement is one option. Uh, the inherent right to self government agreements, another option. Or there's alternative federal legislation, the First Nations Land Management Act, the Fiscal Management Act. That's legislation adopted when Jean Chrétien was prime minister. So on the right hand side, you have the Department of Crown Indigenous Relations. And um, in 2016, um, prime, Min Just, prime Minister Justin Trudeau referred to Indigenous government, governments as being the fourth level of government in Canada. So that's where if you sign these Section 35 agreements, they'll be implemented through the Department of Crown Indigenous Relations. And you'll go in under the self-government fiscal policy, which is a formula. And it includes own source revenue, meaning taxation. As federal transfers are reduced, the Indigenous group under the self-governing group has to pick up the slack by collecting taxes to pay for the cost of governance, the share in the cost of governance and programs and services. So this is a this is the chart to transform from the status quo track one of of um, you know indigenous services over to crown indigenous relations and the federal government has said that they're going to dissolve the department of indigenous services once they've transferred the responsibility for program delivery to indigenous governing bodies so this is just the temporary department the department of indigenous crown relations will be there as long as there's indigenous peoples left. Uh, within law. So in Valentine's Day in 2018, the Prime Minister, after introducing these 10 principles and, and dissolving Indian Affairs and creating these two new departments, announced that there was going to be a framework for recognition and implementation of rights. And um, at the time, the Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould was very happy with the speech in the House of Commons. Um, and that proposed uh, rights recognition framework was subsequently rejected by First Nations across Canada by September of that year. And um, there was an overview document that was released at a meeting outlining uh, what a federal rights recognition framework law would, that it would have formed the basis for all relations between the federal crown and Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis and Inuit, including pre-1975 and post-1975 treaties. In other words, historic treaties and modern treaties would have been included under this law. And it, the law would have contained federal definitions of key terms. Like I said, they like to take terms like the inherent right and define it under their policy to control and manage. Uh, Aboriginal rights, treaty rights would have been defined. Um, but the federal and provincial territorial governments and powers and jurisdictions would continue to dominate um, over First Nations and provincial governments would continue to have a veto over any agreements affecting their jurisdiction. So this rights recognition framework was basically um, taking the inherent right policy from a policy level to a legislative framework and implementing it through a rights recognition framework. Uh, the components of this proposed rights recognition framework also included uh, the federal government establishing an advisory committee or institution that would have been created to decide 
what indigenous nations or collectives would be federally recognized and have the authority of a government possessing the legal capacity of a natural person, which means a federal corporation, basically. And it would have been subject to agreements with the federal and provincial governments where their jurisdictions affected and the federal legislation would have included a list of powers for indigenous governments, which could be amended by the only by the federal government. So again, this is all elements of what's in that inherent right to self-government policy. This would have elevated it into legislation. And as I've said, the, the um, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has said indigenous governments are the fourth level of government in Canada, making them lower in status than federal, provincial and municipal governments. So what's the status of the reconciliation plan? <clears throat> um, basically, um, the, the, um, the 2015 promises uh, of a nation to nation uh, process really has turned out to be a pan indigenous approach, uh, but remains based on the composed 1995 inherent right policy. The national reconciliation framework um, although it didn't pass into a bill, they've been discussing it at different tables, like these recognition tables they've created, uh, modern treaty tables, self-government tables. That's They're still implementing their reconciliation framework, um, basically in secret at negotiation and discussion tables. But it's still based on this unilateral Section 35 policy framework of their self-government policy and land claims and this alternative federal legislation. Uh, and also, the, they right from the beginning, they said there would be a Canadian definition of the UN Declaration on the rights of Indigenous peoples, which they've now introduced Bill C-15 on December 3rd um, to basically push um, the Canadian definition of the UN Declaration. And that's why uh, quite a few of us call it CANDRA, the Canadian Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, not the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and that's something you should look into is the debate around Bill C-15 because there's definitely a debate. And they only introduced that bill, uh, you know, uh, after six weeks of selective engagement, they bypassed the communities during a pandemic to introduce that, that proposed bill into parliament. Um, and in terms of enacting the 94 Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action in the UN uh, Declaration Federal Action, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Asian Commission calls to action. Some were directed towards the federal government, some towards uh, provincial governments, and some towards civil society, uh, including you know universities and, and law programs and that. Uh, the ones directed to the federal government, they've they've said it's partially complete. Um, and as I mentioned, you know they're in, they've introduced Bill C-15 um, to address their promise to implement the UN Declaration. Lifting the 2% funding cap remains to be seen. They're claiming they've done that in their fiscal policies, but we have to see how these 10 year grants roll out because they're not giving new money. It's, you know, they still control um, releasing the monies every year, but there's a 10 year agreement and you, you keep at your current funding rate. You're not getting an increase. And the self-government fiscal policy formula, um, They've suspended that for three years, about a year ago. So I think there's two years left. They're doing a baseline analysis of that. Uh, they're gonna come back with a new funding formula. They're looking at, for example, in the Yukon, they're looking at Whitehorse and what is their government um, cost to deliver uh, governance and programs and services. And so they'll be adjusting the funding formula to make it more comparable to what uh, non-Indigenous governments get in the country, in the regions that they're in. So that will be uh, coming forward soon. They promised a full review of federal law and par par policy in full partnership with First Nations, but this became a top-down approach using the National Indigenous Organizations, the Assembly of First Nations in, in the First Nations case. And um, Jody Wilson-Raybould was charged with that at the beginning, but they pushed her aside when there was a conflict between her and Carolyn Bennett. Michael Warnick um, testified you know, before the Justice and Human Rights Committee during the SNC-Lavalin scandal that he had to get involved because of the fight between the two ministers. And obviously they sided with um, Carolyn Bennett and the approach that she took on, on this law and policy review and reconciliation framework. Uh, 
um, because Jody Wesner-Abode was subsequently demoted to Veterans Affairs Minister before she resigned. Uh, there's a lot that happened in there that we don't know because of cabinet secrecy, but uh, the Law and Policy Review is now in charge of cabinet through a reconciliation committee that they have, you know, and cabinet committees are secret. And in terms of the Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry, <clears throat> the federal government still has not come up with an action plan responding to the, the commission's um, findings and recommendations, uh, including the finding that Canada is committing a form of genocide um, against uh, Indigenous families uh, right through to today. They haven't addressed that yet uh, in any um, action plan. And Minister Bennett has said it's because of the pandemic. Um, so they're using the pandemic, in my view, to get away with a lot. So I focused on two of the major liberal promises from their 2019 election platform. They, they promised to take action to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in the first year of a new mandate. So as I said, after only a six week process during a pandemic, they introduced uh, Bill C-15, the UN Declaration Act into Parliament. Um, and um, you know, um, basically the only reason they did it is because they promised to do it in their platform, you know, be within one year of, of the election. Um, but if they meant to do that, they should have started consultations with all 630 bands across the country right after the 2019 federal election. Instead, they waited six weeks before they introduced it, uh, deliberately, I would argue. Um, they also promised in 2019 that they would live up to the spirit and intent of treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements. My understanding is the terms of reference for that National Treaty Commission are under development now, including the historic and modern treaties. Um, it's unclear again under whose mandate this is happening, you know, who the federal government's retained and how the process is going to work. But this is typical, you know, as they they operate by stealth until they're ready to spring it into the public. So I just want to cover quickly what is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? I've been referring to it. I encourage everybody to get this book, Indigenous Nations Rights in the Balance an analysis of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples by Shermaine Whiteface. Um, it's a really important book, which does, you know, an analysis of the Declaration itself. So if you want to understand Bill C-15, you really have to understand the UN Declaration. This book is excellent. It gives a side-by-side -side analysis of the various versions that went through the United Nations. Um, there are 46 articles in the UN Declaration. I've just highlighted some of the uh, the key ones. To me, the most important uh, article is the right of self-determination because it connects Indigenous peoples to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Education, Social, Cultural Rights, you know, the rights of all peoples to self-determination. And, it, you know, the United Nations has said self-determination is a remedy to colonialism. And I also think it's a counterbalance to Article 46. Uh, which says nothing in this declaration can be interpreted to challenge the assumed sovereignty or territorial integrity of the state. Um, Article 10 says there's no forced removal without free prior informed consent. Well, the government of British Columbia and Canada violated that when they removed the Wet'suwet'en uh, last year from their territory, even though the government of British Columbia had, um, like Canada's proposing, adopted uh, <coughs> Bill 41 the UN Declaration Law in British Columbia. <clears throat> and, um, and the Prime Minister, BC Premier Horgan was asked when that um, conflict with the Wet'suwet'en was going on, what about that United Nations law that your government passed? He said, well, it's forward looking, not retrospective. So I think when you're looking at, you know, provincial or federal legislation proclaiming to say they're implementing the UN Declaration, uh, the people need to be involved because in BC, it was a top-down approach with Bill 41. And the 203 bans in British Columbia, I'm pretty sure they don't know the implications of that law and how the BC government's interpreting it. Same thing's true about the proposed federal bill, uh, C-15, which mirrors what they did in BC. 
you know, with the top down approach. Um, Article 19, free prime farm consent is required before legislative and administrative uh, measures. Uh, it says that the governments have to talk to um, Indigenous representatives. I didn't include Article 18 here, I should have, because Article 18 says for self-representation that Indigenous peoples have the right uh, under their own Indigenous institutions and their own Indigenous procedures uh, to be involved in the decision-making process of choosing their representatives. Uh, and in Canada, bands and band councils are not Indigenous institutions and band council resolutions are not Indigenous procedures. But since um, the government proclaimed that they're endorsing, giving unqualified support for the UN Declaration, they haven't done anything to make sure Indigenous uh, peoples are involved in the decision making beyond the Indian Act band councils. Um, Article 26 is the rights of lands, territories, and resources. I'm going to go into Article 26, 27, 28 in more detail. Article 32 is really where free prime farm consent is required for development affecting lands, territories, and resources. That's what the six uh, premiers who are opposing Bill C-15 are pointing to, that they're concerned about it being a veto for resource extraction. But none of them point to Article 46, which basically seems to say that um, Indigenous peoples can't challenge, you know, the Canadian state's sovereignty or territorial integrity, which I think it's our birthright to do anyway, but they don't mention that. And of course, Article 37 talks about the rights of treaties, agreements, and constructive arrangements. So the, the important thing to know is the UN Declaration is watered down at the United Nations. There were three main drafts of the UN Declaration. 1994 was the original text version of the United Nations Declaration. And that was developed uh, um, by a working group on Indigenous populations and had a lot of uh, input from and approval from Indigenous peoples. In 2006, there was a second amended version that the Human Rights Council and official from the United Nations revised um, that did not include broad Indigenous uh, participation in those revisions. And the same in 2007, when the final version of the UN Declaration was adopted by the General Assembly, uh, there were changes made at the proposed at the last minute by the African Union, including Article 46. And there was not Indigenous um, um, discussion um, on the final version, which the United Nations uh, adopted, which we're now talking about in Canada today. And it's that original text version um, from 1994 that was drafted by hundreds of Indigenous representatives over a period of years. And uh, I went to Geneva, Switzerland with um, some uh, uh, Algonquin representatives um, several times um, to give input into the drafting of you know, what became that 1994 uh, version of the Declaration. So I'm very aware of the process that occurred at the United Nations and, and how that was manipulated by state governments and watered down uh, to the version that they, they've adopted now. So I wanna focus on the UN Declaration, the articles on land uh, restoration and restitution because, um, and also, you know, what we have to go through to get land back through these self-determination plans. Um, you never hear the Trudeau government talk about Article 26. Actually, the government of BC didn't talk about this either. Um, Article 26 says Indigenous peoples have the right to lands, territories, and resources, which they've traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used and acquired. Um, Indigenous peoples have the right to own, use, develop, and control their lands, territories, and resources they possess um, by reason of traditional ownership or other traditional occupation or use. Uh, states shall give legal recognition and protection to these lands, territories, and resources. Um, so that's really important. The, the UN Declaration says there should be restoration of lands, territories, and resources. Article 27 says states shall establish and implement in conjunction with Indigenous peoples concerned uh, a fair and independent, impartial, open, and transparent process, giving due recognition to Indigenous peoples' laws, traditions, customs, and land tenure systems to recognize and adjudicate the rights of Indigenous peoples pertaining to their lands, territories, and resources, including those which were traditionally owned or otherwise occupied or used. Indigenous peoples shall have the right to participate in this process. We've never had any say in the land claims policies of the federal government which were announced in 1973, they're still in place. 
It was Pierre Elliott Trudeau that announced those uh, land claims policies and Justin Trudeau is implementing his father's land claims policies today, but they're in breach of Article 27 of the UN Declaration. Uh, Article 28 says Indigenous peoples have a right to redress, including restitution um, and fair and equitable compensation where equal quantities of land cannot be given. So there's restoration and restoration that are the international minimum standards built into the UN Declaration. All of the Trudeau governments talked about as programs and services, not land rights. So for First Nations to counter the UN federal reconciliation agenda, um, what I'm saying is you have to get into a research and mapping process and to develop these self-determination plans. And I believe in indigenous data sovereignty, that's something that we have to use. The Supreme Court of Canada has uh, imposed under their interpretation of section 35 legal tests for Aboriginal rights and title. Um, in terms of Aboriginal rights, if you assert you have a, a section 35 Aboriginal right, uh, in 1996, the Supreme Court laid out a test in, in the Vanderpeet case where they said the right has to be an activity that was a practice, tradition or custom that was central and significant a part of the Aboriginal society's distinctive nature and the activity must have existed prior to contact with European settlers. And it has to have survived you know, into a modern form after 1982, despite the continued colonialism of the, the government. This is really a high threshold to meet. It really costs millions and millions of dollars to collect the cultural and historical evidence. And even then there's no guarantee you're gonna win a, a court case under this test. Uh, in 1997, for the first time, the Supreme Court in the Delgamuk decision recognized that Aboriginal title exists in Canada. And uh, they said the, the nature of Aboriginal title is it titles a right to exclusive use and occupation of the land, a right to choose uh, what uses of the land can be put, subject to the limit that you cannot use it to destroy the ability of land to sustain future generations. In other words, you can't pave over a sacred area. Uh, lands held person to Aboriginal title have an inescapable economic component. The Haida went to the Supreme Court and that's where the duty to consult and accommodate comes through. Uh, the legal tests around that where the Crown has a duty to consult uh, Indigenous peoples comes from the Haida test, the Haida case. In 2014, the Supreme Court in the Chocotan decision that's the first time they recognized that Aboriginal title exists on the ground to a particular group. Um, the Chilcotin decision reaffirms the principles and tests and previous Supreme Court decisions, including Delgamuk and Haida, sets a, out a framework for progressive recognition of Aboriginal title from assertion or potential title to establishment of title. But also the Supreme Court said that it, it, they, they recognize, they, find that the radical underlying title to all the land was acquired by the Crown. Uh, in that case, they said the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Um, so they're maintaining the doctrine of discovery, which is what, you know, that's based on. And of course, the proof for Aboriginal title, it still comes to the claimant group. They have to burden a proof. Uh, and, has, and the test is there has to be sufficient occupation of the land uh, to establish title at the time of European sovereignty. It has to be continued through current use and occupancy mapping to prove that uh, where groups are today that they're connected to the lands um, right from their ancestors. And that it has to be exclusive historic occupation. So in other words, the issue of overlap comes in. Um, you know, is it land um, held by the indigenous nation or did other indigenous nations make incursions and also claim it? So each, uh, Indian Act band has to deal with consultation requests from Crown governments, mostly provincial governments. And um, the duty to consult under the, the Delgamuk, Haida and Chilcotin tests um, says that Crown governments have to apply those court cases uh, and do a strength of claim analysis where they apply those legal tests to any consultation or information responses that they get on a proposed project or activity on the traditional territory of Indian bands, First Nations, to determine how strong a potential for rights are that exist in a spectrum of rights. Um, they're saying, for example, a weak 
a week, uh, right, might be, I don't know, the right to a fishing rock, you know, to annually go and fish um, on a rock. But the strongest would be strong potential for proving Aboriginal title. So that's where they have to do a depth of consultation analysis after the strength of claim, where they assess the uh, evidence um, from the strength of claim analysis to determine if it's weak, then all they have to do is give a notice to say, you know, we're going to have a mine in your territory or we're going to do mining exploration, or if there's a potential for proving strong uh, Aboriginal rights or, or title, then they have to start talking about accommodation measures like changing the project, modifying it, offering compensation, things like that. So that's what each band in the country has to go through um, as a result of these court decisions. And that really leads to the capacity needs, you know, there needs to be capacity building for information management because the relationship with the Crown governments is becoming more and more complicated and legal and political and economic. So First Nation bands need funding to organize internally to manage consultation requests from, from Crown governments or third parties, meaning like corporations, logging companies, mining companies. So First Nations need in-house or outside consultants to provide independent technical and scientific advice on natural resource management and regional planning issues, you know, for their traditional territory. And there needs to be modern methods of keeping track of consultations. So, you know, information comes in all forms from different sources. In order to make, you know, for free private farm consent to happen, you need information. And so you get all this information and the key is you need to have advisors to help you interpret that information so that you can make a proper decision. And um, it, this is becoming increasingly complex <clears throat> for indigenous communities and nations. Um, so for the assessment of rights versus impacts from moving from consultation to consent, First Nations need to set up a consultation tracking system needs to be connected to an information management system that includes GIS mapping. Uh, they need to develop internal consultation uh, procedures and processes with their community members and maybe other communities from the same nation or neighboring communities. And they also need to develop an external protocol process and procedures to deal with provincial governments, federal governments, outside um, corporations that want to develop on, uh, on their traditional territories. This is an example for, you know, of um, a proposed uh, mining exploration drilling. <clears throat> it's, it's not a real site. It's just to give you an example of the kind of information that needs to be used for decision making to discuss with mining companies and, and provincial governments. You know, the cultural values that are there, um, the, um, the wildlife values, what kind of vegetation, the hydrology, the drainage, you know, the geophysical information tourism and economic values, what would be the impacts of mining drilling in a particular site? And then it says in the recommendation would be to talk to different people who have pin numbers, you know, to keep confidentiality. But there would be indigenous peoples who hunt fish and trap in this area and, and they would be, their information would be on this map. So this is the kind of process, you know, that has to be gone through on the duty to consult. And really it should involve consent. But you know you don't get to that stage until you start establishing that you have rights, not the potential. So with all this burden of proof, what I'm saying, you have to assess your history, language, culture, and indigenous law. Uh, you need to know your your uh, practices, laws, and treatment of your peoples by crown governments. You need to be able to show evidence whether you're exercising rights or responding to court actions against you for stepping off reserve and and challenging. Uh, interests on your traditional territory that you didn't agree to. You also need not only to collect the historical and cultural information, but you also need to have the contemporary land and resource information, resource models and inventories, obstacles from uh, legislation and regulations of provincial and federal governments, list of the third parties operating without consent in your territory, and identification of alienated lands versus less encumbered lands. So I'm thinking like less encumbered would be crown lands that haven't been allocated that are your traditional territory. Um, but the encumbered lands would be like cities, towns, um, timber licenses, mining permits and licenses, things like that that start to alienate your land without your consent. 
And that's the situation across the country of most First Nations is they've been overrun and they have to show that they have a right or interest to change, change the regional plans. Which gets to the valuation. You need to identify criteria and provide parameters for attaching values to your Aboriginal title or your historic treaty lands um, and estimate the value of the resources taken out if you're gonna talk about compensation you know, for lands taken without any benefit. Um, and so, you know, the, the existence of Aboriginal title or treaty rights is a legal interest and it can affect the corporate security of 10 years supply, stock valuation, cost of borrowing, et cetera. In other words, it creates risk for investors if they go into your territory without your consent. You know, insurance companies and banks that are, you know, paying for equipment or whatever of operators, um, you, you can increase the risk by documenting that, you know, those are your resources that are being taken. And that leads to assessing uh, negotiation and, and um, you know, litigation readiness. You have to have the knowledge of the Canadian constitution and international legal and policy frameworks. You need to have uh, access to an interdisciplinary team of advisors. Uh, you need to identify sources of sustained funding to, to do negotiations or litigation. And you need to look at court strategies and international strategies to put pressure on as well as political action on the ground. So in conclusion, um, in order to take action and exercise self-determination, um, you know, that's, that's the heart of the strategy. And that's a collective right that lies with the nation and the community. It's up to the people themselves to initiate actions which reflect the exercise of their rights and their inherent jurisdiction over their lands, territories, and resources. But when they exercise, um, you know, either title or treaty rights, it's likely the federal or provincial governments will, will drag First Nations and communities into court, probably through injunction proceedings, proceedings like we've seen with many conflicts, and then the police come in. And in case of 1990, the army um, in Gunawagi and Gunasadagi. So the first steps to organize the people starts with the family and community. If possible, the community should try and get together with other communi communities, um, the same nation, do the proper spiritual and cultural protocols to organize for the people to be involved in decision making. And then you have to plan and prepare. You have to seek consensus and authority from the community or nation, not necessarily through the band council, through the people. And, the, you know, sort out the physical setting you're going to move in, the communications you need, the media relations, the security, and see if you can find third parties as allies. So I'll end by saying, um, you know, you need to educate yourselves. And I always point to my friend, Art Manuel, who did two excellent uh, books before he passed on. Uh, if you want to know more about this, I recommend both books um, to learn about you know, what's going on in Canada. I've only given you an overview, but Art's books get into much more detail. So with that, um, I thank you. Wow, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I know I know that was an overview. There was tons more information, and and even that was a little bit overwhelming at times, depending on what your background is. Um, I know we have lots of questions. I have lots of questions myself. Um, so I'll ask anyone who does have a question. You can put it in the chat if you like. I already have three people who are ready to ask their questions. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Angela, who is from Algoma. Um, at university and she's looking to uh, ask you a question. Are you ready, Angela? I am, miigwech. So first off, I'd like to say miigwech to Laurentian University as well as Russell Diabo for um, creating this space for all of us to hear these uh, awesome words and um, critical reflections that we all need to uh, take time to look more into. So that being said, um, I just have a question for Russell and um, it pertains to the First Nations Elections Act. Um, and I guess my question is, is because I'm concerned about my own community moving forward on this, um, aside from not really consulting our community properly, but the fact that it looks and appears to me um, that we are um, eroding our rights from that nation to nation level um, even though um, they're, they're indicating that their hope is to um, 
develop our own election code and then move up and out of the First Nation Election Act, which would make us the only First Nation community in all of Canada to do this. My question to you is, um, and I don't know if you know the answer, but do we possibly see a situation where government might not allow us to move up and out of that? And is and are we um, eroding our rights to uh, the provincial level? Thank you. Well, like I said at the beginning, self-government was the main issue in the constitutional talks, whether it was an inherent right or a contingent right that wasn't resolved. You know, the, those talks about the meaning of Section 35 um, ended in failure. The courts took over defining Section 35, but they haven't explicitly ruled on whether self-government is an Aboriginal right or not. There was a court case in BC at the Court of Appeal, I think it's called the Wilson case, where it involved the Nishka because um, the province was challenging the Nishka modern treaty, you know, whether the Nishka had a right to negotiate it. The court said they did, that, you know, negotiating showed that they had the right of self-government because they were negotiating a modern treaty. But the Supreme Court of Canada hasn't dealt with that issue. Uh, and the federal inherent right policy, as they call it, is the policy that's been in place since 1995. It's still the umbrella policy. So, the only way out of the Indian Act is either through federal legislation um, or through negotiating a self-government agreement. So the federal legislation includes the First Nations Elections Act. Uh, it's, it's a way to control and manage us. It's the way to control and manage the transition away from the Indian Act into a new relationship, as they call it. Um, I would argue that it's not consistent with the right of um, you know, the inherent right of self-government that was intended to be uh, in the promise that they made in 1995 or in 1993. Um, that's why I, I'm concerned about their definition of the UN Declaration because international customary law, you know, some of the articles of the UN Declaration involve international customary law and that this right of self-determination is one of them. So I would say the First Nations Elections Act um, you know, is definitely a violation of the right of self-determination. But if you consent to it, if you opt into it, well, definitely, you know, the Crown is going to be able to use that to say you consented to it. Um, the same with self-government agreements. They, they, uh, they don't consider Indian Act bans as being self-governing because you're under the Indian Act and under the minister who has discretion over everything that happens on reserve. But um, they won't recognize that you know, if a group of people declare themselves to be self-governing and move out onto the land, um, they'll declare you to be um, operating outside of the law. Um, look at the Wet'suwet'en. You know, clearly the Supreme Court of Canada recognized that the Wet'suwet'en are, um, are the um, inherent authority on traditional lands outside of reserves in the Wet'suwet'en territory, but the government stopped short of recognizing they had Aboriginal title. But clearly, the Supreme Court recognized, um, you know, that the the hereditary chiefs and clans, what they call houses out there, are the authority that have the land tenure and the decision making authority. But because there was not a territory recognized, then the governments didn't follow up with negotiations with them, you know, because they're using their land claims policies, which the Wet'suwet'en didn't agree with, and their self government policy. The government didn't negotiate with them since 1997 until they went and blocked um, a pipeline, you know, based on their inherent authority and they were removed. So it's tough to get recognition because while they have an inherent right policy, it doesn't recognize the inherent right, the inherent right to self-government unless you have an agreement with the federal government or you accept their legislation. So it's a struggle to get recognition. But one of the first things I think we need to do is, is show that it's a farce to call that an inherent right policy when it's an anything but inherent right policy. And that's the same policy they're using to negotiate with the Union of Ontario Indians this, and the Anishinaabeg Nation Governance Agreements. And it's the same policy they use to negotiate the Anishinaabeg Nation Education Agreement, which are under the laws of Ontario. You can look at the legislation. That was all under the inherent right policy that the, those were negotiated. And that's what they're negotiating at all the tables across the country. So it's tough. You know, you have to decide, I guess, if you're going to, to concede or surrender to the federal authority and opt in 
to getting out of the Indian Act into the Elections Act to choose your to select your leaders, or if you're going to continue to fight and push for international right of self determination. It's not easy, you know. I can't uh, advise you on what to do. I'm just telling you that's the system you're up against. Anyway. Thank you for your, your question, Angela, and thanks for your response. Um, it's definitely definitely very complicated as you we went through. There's so many red flags that are raised in the, in the bureaucracy, the burden of proof. Um, so some surprises there today. Um, I think we'll go over to, to Kevin, who has a question as well. Are you ready, Kevin? Yes, uh, good day, Miigwech. Um, as, a, um, as a settler's grandson, I have a question about um, land back and is it possible, is there a trigger, is there any way that land can be given back um, that is outside of reservation territories? So for example, I sit, luckily steward 100 acres outside of the city of Toronto and I have interest in trying to uh, discover whether or not there's a way that this that I could land back this parcel? That's a good question. Um, right now, there is no system. For the last 250 some years, the Crown has been seeking the surrender of Aboriginal title through treaties um, and other, other means. Um, you know, British Columbia, you know, quite a few parts of Canada don't have land treaties. So British Columbia, parts of Ontario, um, Quebec, um, the Atlantic region, um, north of 60, they didn't have land treaties, but the comprehensive claims policy, they've been doing land claims agreements, which are now called modern treaties. Um, Canada, through the First Nations Tax Commission, has also um, been working on what they call First Nations Property Ownership Initiative. Um, what's the that started under the Harper government, but it's continued under the Trudeau government, and they they call it an Indigenous Land Title Initiative now, make it sound nicer, but it's still about privatizing um, residential lands on reserve into fee simple. Um, that's the objective of the government is you know eventually to to get the reserves um, you know uh, the the land status changed. Um, they're doing that through the Land Management Act incrementally. But the objective is to ultimately get uh, lands held in private property and uh, merged with the provincial land registry system. I think there should be a recognition of an indigenous title system where the land uh, reverts to indigenous title, which I think is the underlying title. But the problem is you got the Supreme Court of Canada relying on the doctrine of discovery saying the radical or underlying title belongs to the crown. When as Indigenous peoples, we know that's a damn lie, that it's Aboriginal title. And it's Crown title is the burden on Aboriginal title. But they reverse it in the Supreme Court decision, which is why I think international law is important that we start arguing and using, you know, international forum to uh, raise our issues outside of Canada. Because there's 370 million Indigenous peoples in over 90 countries. And we all share the same uh, common problems of state governments, you know, invading our territories and trying to finish us off. You know, I'd argue that the, the Trudeau government's trying to finish off what the Indian Act started. And that's happening around the world. You know, you can point to any country where there's indigenous peoples who still survive and they're struggling with the same issues. In fact, the four countries that voted against the UN declaration in 2007, there was only four was Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand, all of whom have indigenous peoples. And they also have policies that are in breach of the standards in the UN Declaration. So it's, it's a, that's a main issue, I would say, for land back is dealing with the issue of indigenous title. How does the Crown recognize it? Because it's all been one way so far. <clears throat> if I can just follow, follow up very quickly, um, is it, would a wampum, uh, could a wampum be created that, that, that would present the land back that way? Is that possible? Symbolically, but uh, not under the Canadian legal system. I remember um, 
one of the customary chiefs I worked with that was headquartered in Quebec, he brought up the fact that his community had wampum agreements with the British uh, government going back to 1760. And the minister was the minister of Quebec government. And he said, well, there's no signature on that wampum belt. That was his response. <laughs> but symbolically, I guess, you know, you could start a process that way. But, you know, what I'm talking about is the the federal government would have the jurisdiction. It couldn't be a province. The federal government would have to, um, you know, initiate a process uh, to recognize that indigenous title exists, separate from crown title, you know, separate from the provinces and separate from um, the federal government, like a land registry system for Aboriginal title lands. The only country that has that, and you can look into this, is Australia, from the 1993 uh, Native Title Act. Uh, they do have a land registry system in Australia for Aboriginal lands, Aboriginal title lines. Canada has not adopted anything like that, but there's a model there that could be looked at. Great, uh, great question. I th I've heard that one a few times, so it's great to know that people are thinking about this and working towards it. Um, the next individual is, is it Patrick? Do you have a question? I'll just unmute you. Give uh, give us a second. We can't hear you yet. Still can't hear you. I'll let you work on that just for a second. Um, did we have Bert who had a question as well? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, my question is to Russell is, um, our elected leadership has gone ahead uh, with land claims without uh, due process, which means consulting the people. If they go ahead and sign away our rights, do we have any way of um, getting back by consensus? Getting our rights back as First Nations by consensus, pardon me. Like, is there a way to stop the, the land claims if, if they don't consult the people? Well, it's pretty hard because what the uh, federal government, certainly the Trudeau government is doing is they're using um, the Indian Act Band Councils um, as the representatives. Uh, actually, they're taking a top-down approach using the Assembly First Nations and the band councils and, and chiefs organizations to be involved in the changes that they've been making to policy, to laws, and to restructuring the government by creating these two, dissolving Indian Affairs Department and creating two new Indigenous departments. Um, as I mentioned in the UN Declaration, and I know a lot of our people have concerns about the UN Declaration. You know, I've heard everything, you know, about a global conspiracy, that the United Nations is a global conspiracy and, uh, and they don't trust the UN Declaration, especially because of Article 46, you know, saying that uh, you can't challenge the sovereignty or territory of the state. Um, but as I pointed out, Article 3, self-determination, and Art Manuel and I agreed with this, is we think that's the counterbalance. Uh, so we have to look at what does self-determination mean. And each of our uh, communities and nations, we have our protocols and ceremonies for decision-making of the people. The Indian Act displaced that because it made um, band councils the, the form of indirect rule that Ottawa uses over us to make decisions, plus the funding, right, that goes into delivering programs and services through the band offices. So there's a colonial system that's maintained through the Indian Act or in negotiating these modern Section 35 agreements. Um, the only time that people get to have a say is when it comes time for, you know, ratification of agreements like a land claims agreement. There would have to be a settlement offer from the federal government and the, they need proof that at least they lower the threshold instead of it being 50% plus one, Canada has lowered the threshold often in these community uh, decisions to 25% of the membership uh, to approve or ratify agreements. So the band councils negotiate them in secret. They bring it out uh, to the people and the only time that people have a say is to vote yes or no to a proposed uh, settlement. 
And uh, if 25% show up and the majority of the 25% vote yes, um, then the government accepts that as the agreement being ratified, whether it's a land claims agreement or a self-government agreement or a modern treaty. And um, other than that, the people don't have a say because you know the government uh, is doing this in secret. Um, they use the band council, the Indian Act band council system. Because like I said, they don't view Indian bands as being uh, self-governing bodies because they're controlled under the Indian Act or federal legislation. And the only way out of the, the federal legislation is uh, to negotiate an agreement or to opt into other federal legislation like the Elections Act or the Fiscal Management Act or the Land Management Act. Um, so it's tough. But I, I would say I would focus, if you're going to talk about the UN Declaration and the international standards in there, Article 18 says that Indigenous peoples have a right to decision making through their own Indigenous institutions and their own Indigenous procedures. And that's what I would use on the chief and councils to say that you're violating the UN Declaration by not recognizing the people's voice through you know, our decisions that we, we made prior to the, the uh, imposition of the Indian Act. Um, in the Haudenosaunee communities, you know, we have traditional peoples, traditional houses that still exist in parallel to band council systems. Um, people make decisions through those, um, those houses. Uh, the people's voice is, is recognized, you know, through, through the longhouses. Uh, the Anishinaabe have their own way of doing that. Um, other nations have their ways. So I, I would say that's what you need to look into is what are the ceremonies and protocols for bringing circles of people together to start, you know, being involved in the decision making. Um, but like I said, the burden of proof's on us. So, you know, you have to do your research, mapping and planning because if you don't, you're going to wind up in court, uh, in jail. I mean, there's a decision the Supreme Court of Canada handed down called the Bain decision. B-E-H-N, Bain. It's a family that uh, in, in northeastern BC. They went to the Supreme Court arguing as a family group that they didn't agree with the, that they were consulted to have their family territory logged. But the government, the provincial government responded, well, the, we consulted the band council and they agreed. And um, the court said, you know, um, a group has to have the mandate from the group in order to represent the collective rights. And in that case, they said the band council had that mandate, not the family group. And so that, that, that's led to different groups in communities trying to do blockades and stuff and being charged with injunctions saying that they don't have the consent of their community. They don't represent their community. So, you know, you need to think about these things because you're up against the legal and political system of Canada, whether you like it or not. Um, so that's the way we have to be strategic and do the planning, like I say, and the strategies. We need the information. We need young people with a, to get the information management skills we need to, uh, to make decisions. That's what FPIC or Free Prime Farm Consents about is information. People, are scared of change and they need information to make sure that they're consenting to something that they can agree to a plan, you know. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but you know, that's the system I that have. Um, we're up against. It was my understanding that our chief and council only have powers to the borders of the said reservations um, and the remainder of our lands go under our hereditary chiefs, would the council have to have the chiefs involved with all their decisions if, if they were going to sign away our rights to our lands? Well, I work with different Anishinaabe communities, uh, particularly Algonquin uh, governments on the Quebec side, including a, a customary chief that never came in under the Indian Act system. They've been forced under it now, but before that, under their custom, you know, they had land tenure about how, how land, family territories were uh, recognized and, and maintained. And um, they had, they were under the Indian, recognized as a band under the Indian Act, but they were also a customary council recognized under Anakinagawan under Anishinaabe law. So you need to look at the fact situation band by band. You can't just blanketly say the Indian Act chief and council don't have a mandate beyond the reserve. It depends on the historical and cultural facts of a particular band. 
because in some cases the hereditary system has merged with the elective system. Um, and so they, they, and they, the ones that have our customary leaders know they have to involve the people. At least that's what I've seen. They don't make decisions about the land because they know they're affecting the individual rights of their, their people. So they make sure that they have consensus amongst the people before they do anything involving the land. But Indian Act chief and councils don't have that same standard. They go by what Ottawa says. So that's the problem. And like I say, they're trying to control the way out of the Indian Act by saying your only way out is door number one, door number two, or door number three. Mm -hmm. They don't recognize we have an inherent right to self-determination um, to make those decisions for ourselves. And if we challenge their system, they come back at us with courts and police. And again, you need evidence to defend yourself, historical and cultural evidence to justify you know, your actions. And even if you wanna make an international human rights complaint, you still need that evidence. So there's no way around doing the, the necessary, you know, grind of doing research and, and doing mapping and doing plans. Because if you do it without a plan, wind up in jail and charged, you know, and maybe doing time. I can give you lots of examples where um, Indigenous peoples across Canada have done that and that's what's happened to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Russell. I really appreciate your input. That's I, I learned a lot today. Miigwech. Thanks again for your your question, Bert. Um, I hope you're okay staying on a little bit a little bit longer. We have lots of questions for you, Russ. Um, and I think as we go through, more questions are popping up. So I think we have four more. Um, so keep that in mind. We'll have Patrick. We'll try you again. I think we're working now. And then we'll go over to uh, Teso Handil. I said your name wrong. I'm sure. So Patrick, you're up next. Still can't hear you, eh? Even though you're unmuted. Still can't hear you, sir. I'm sorry, even though you're unmuted. I don't know what's going on. You can write your question in the chat if you like. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Tehu Sanil. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. I just wanted to uh, say miigwech and yawangoa uh, for uh, sharing what you had shared. And I had jotted some stuff down and I appreciate your input. It's very important to uh, to us younger generation that are coming up with this, with, uh, with uh, this knowledge and understanding that um, and an outlook on life that, uh, that the government may have uh, try to understand or, or just, just, just to hear and learn from, uh, someone of experience of such as yourself. And, um, I had written some stuff down. Uh, the first step is organizing the people and then protocol through traditional aspect. And then, uh, uh, inter, um, then organizing a team. So these three things I had written down, I got so, Aboriginal self, agree, uh, uh, government uh, needed is important information and, uh, and uh, uh, legislation. I'm not really a, a very good uh, speaker or writer, but um, <laughs> at the same time, I do understand a lot of their traditional aspects. I've been uh, just learning a lot of things that are important to our people and 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 what is needed for Mother Earth. Uh, because of her her pain and suffering that she's going through and that uh a lot of things that uh I did not understand but um just coming up now uh that you know it's the seventh generation and um and uh it was said that every color uh from every directional point will 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 be awakened and that uh, we'll see more and understand a lot more if we don't do something soon that there will not be anything to even try to fight for or help or to understand. 
So I wrote these things down and I appreciate it. I just wanted to say, uh, Miigwech and Yawangoa. Um, my, my, yep. the name, my name is, uh, Dehocha Neil and, uh, the, which means strong grip. I'm from, uh, Oya Da Age and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm a turtle clan and a Thunderbird clan. Um, and, uh, and I'm just, uh, very, uh, thankful to hear you speak. That's it. Yeah. Huh? Yo. Miigwech for that. Um, I think one or two more questions and we can uh, we can call it. Nadia, do you have a question? Nadia Varelli? Hi. Um, hi, Russ. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so just listening, uh, for first, a little bit of a background of me. I am from Settler Society. My main issue of, or my main research is, issue is uh, federalism. And I center mainly on Quebec nationalism and have been looking at indigenous nationalism and indigenous um, nationhood. And so um, I, I'm, I, I've learned a lot from this talk today and, and talking about um, the issue of, of returning land. Um, and I do think that this is something that we need to strive for. But what I'm wondering and what I'm finding in my research is that the issue uh, starts before that. So it's not so much recognizing indigenous uh, right to land or recognizing indigenous inherent right to nationhood and identity, um, but it's a paradigm shift, this idea of how we view Canada as a nation. And what we see is that the predominant vision of Canada is a one nation state. And in that vision, there is no room for other nations uh, to exist. And so there's always this idea of different claims to nationhood has to fit into this predominant vision of Canada. It was um, something that jumped to mind uh, when the Trudeau government officially stated that it was difficult to implement UNDRIP in Canada because it doesn't necessarily fit in with our constitutional orthodoxy. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on this idea of decolonizing our vision of Canada, decolonizing our predominant federal and constitutional orthodoxy. So we're not constantly trying to fit. Um, so we're not constantly demanding that Indigenous uh, peoples, indigenous nations, try to fix their discourse to match what we've imposed? Yeah, well, Canada is founded on the doctrine of discovery, so it's founded on white supremacy. And uh, the constitution is based on the two founding nations concept between English and French speaking peoples. That's who negotiated the Constitution Act 1867 with the, you know, the British government and what became the British North America Act. So it's constitutionally, the racism starts right there because, um, you know, during pre-Confederation, we were considered allies or military allies and trade partners um, with the British, you know, after the defeat of the French uh, in 1760. And um, that's why we fought as allies in the War of 1812 against the invading Americans. Um, and uh, I would say it's about in, in what's now Ontario and Quebec, it was about 1840 uh, around there that we started to be outnumbered by settlers. And that's when they started to pass laws over us as subjects, not as allies. And they, actually the first pre-Confederation laws were in 1850 when they started to define an Indian. And then, you know, after Confederation, the Indian Act, right, in 1876. But you know, and the idea was to assimilate Indians and get rid of them into the body politic. Even in the 1920s, right, Duncan Campbell Scott said he wanted to continue until there was not one single Indian left. And I would argue Michael Warnick uh, was the modern Duncan Campbell Scott with his plan that he's got Trudeau implementing now. Um, so I consider Canada like, like a South African apartheid state. The only difference is that uh, in South Africa, people of color outnumbered the white people. And so they eventually took over the government. They've got their problems over there. But you know, the point is that in terms of self-government, they took it over. 
we're outnumbered, um, you know, depending on how generous you want to be and uh, defining who is an indigenous person. There's, there seems to be a lot of self-identification going on. Um, there's probably around a million in Canada. So there's no way we're going to get land back or, or get real recognized self-determination unless we get Canadians to support us, at least the progressive Canadians, because Canada does have a racist colonial, uh, um, you know, um, values, I would say, in their society against Indigenous peoples, because uh, it goes right from the beginning that they were taking Indigenous land. So, you know, you've got generations of farmers that hate Indians because they figure they're a threat to their land, right? And you have that across the country. On the prairies, there's racism. In Quebec, there's racism. Um, I can't think of a single province where there isn't racism against Indigenous peoples. And it all has to do with the colonialism that's forced, you know, underdevelopment and poverty and dependency through the Indian Act, while everybody else enriched themselves on our lands, territories, and resources. So there has to be a redistribution of power and, and land for any kind of reconciliation to occur. In fact, my friend, the late Art Manuel said that there will be no reconciliation until the land is given back at least a portion of it. Because if you add up all the reserve lands in Canada, 0.2% <clears throat> of the land mass and the rest is controlled by the federal, territorial, and provincial governments. And um, so we need to see the land base of indigenous peoples expand to be more economically viable. And we need to recognize that self-determined means that internal sovereignty has to happen for us to choose our own forms of decision-making and in institutions and governance, instead of trying to dictate it through national standards under national policies like they're doing now through their self-government policy or through their definition of the UN declaration, because that's what they're trying to do is to take that over now through this bill C-15. So I'd say there's some, some progress being made working with Canadians. Um, I've been involved in networks, like even I Don't Know More includes Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. The Defenders of the Land is a network including Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. So I think we just need to keep working together and creating forums uh, to work cooperatively and to, to promote greater understanding. Um, it's good to see Laurentian, you know, promoting um, lectures and things to cover the topic. That's what the Truth and Reconciliation was promoting. But I would argue that their mandate was so limited that, you know, the, the 94 calls to action aren't going to address the racism and colonialism that still exists, which is why the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls uh, Commission talked about genocides continuing in Canada and having to do a report on defining what that meant because the media all focused on genocide and not on their recommendations and findings. And the Trudeau government still hasn't responded to it, which is typical. You know, they, they take a delay, delayed approach. Meanwhile, they keep implementing their other strategies. So, yeah, I agree with you. There needs to be a paradigm shift. And I think it's happening. Uh, not uh, enough. Yeah, I agree. And uh, just one thing, Emily, just to follow up, I agree with the media focusing on the genocide. And I think it gave the education system the excuse that it needed not to revisit. Uh, because in talking about our colonial past, you know, one thing's back to how present. History... it's not past. Oh, sorry, I'm present. Sorry. So how about the foundations that continue to be um, worked at today. Uh, one thing's back to the education received as early as elementary school and how history um, is taught and how social sciences are, are taught. And, and so I, uh, I agree it's working together and I think education plays a role in... Um, I agree with that. Yeah. I'll leave it at there, Emily. Sorry for taking up so much time. Thank you, Russ. No problem. That was a great question. I think that's a good way to, to end our talk today. Um, and discussing paradigm shifts, that's a, a good way. Um, lots of people were discussing these kinds of things. We talked about grassroots mo grassroots movements and using people and education to, to motivate everyone. I'm wondering how much um, how much of these um, laws being enacted would be different if the the population was properly educated on these topics, right? So it almost feels like they're trying to keep information from us or make it uh, overtly complicated so that the average Canadian doesn't really understand what's going on. Strategic um, words and tactics. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so you you have a lot of experience working with uh, with the Liberal government, but within government and politics, 
Um, and I'm wondering if you have any words of wisdom to leave us with in regards to how to make change as an individual within our community, within our organization. Um, what are some small actionable things that we can put into, put into play so that we can progress these questions and inform the public? Well, I think first is educating yourself, which is why I recommended Art Manual's two books. I think every, uh, every Canadian person should read them because the Unsettling Canada book that Art wrote really was kind of biographical talking about him growing up in a political family because his father, George Manuel, was the first president of the National Indian Brotherhood in the 1970s. And uh, he formed the first in international indigenous organization called the World Council of Indigenous Peoples. So Arthur learned a lot from his father. His brother, Bob Manuel, was also involved in indigenous politics. So the Manuel family has, uh, you know, seen a lot and they and George got into it with Pierre Trudeau so, and Art got into it with you know Justin Trudeau so there's kind of a family uh, a family uh, struggle there dealing with prime ministers and uh, and the other book I would recommend is there's a book about George Manuel's life called From Brotherhood to Nationhood and that really talks about the you know the beginnings of what's known as the modern uh, Indian struggle uh, because it covers the 1950s and 60s and 70s when George was around and it talks about those developments. So it's it's the pre-1982 constitution kind of history that people should know but you know they should also know what's happened since the, the constitutional talks ended in failure because section 35 like I said was supposed to be a political agreement and the courts have taken over and started defining it which is why you know many of us are saying we need to go international and not to stay within Canada's domestic law. So I think, you know, as individuals, you need to educate yourself about, you know, the, uh, the propaganda of the federal government versus what's really going on. Because the communication strategies are propaganda. And some of those books I mentioned are, are some books you could look into that start to peel back the, uh, the uh, you know, the falsehoods, I would say, of the, uh, the federal policies. Because, you know, it sounds good, right? A lot of people say, well, what are you complaining about Trudeau for? He's trying to help you guys, right? Didn't he give you billions of dollars for housing and water, you know, get real boil water advisories? But the thing you have to remember is that's a drop in a bucket of what's actually needed because there's been decades over a century of the Indian Act being applied and the conditions on the reserves deteriorating to such a point that, you know, the housing, the backlog and housing needs and so on. And most of it has to do with the dispossession of lands, territories, and resources. So I would say land back is the key thing that you need to educate yourself on. So when you see people blockading or taking over land, like in Southern Ontario or the Micmacs on, off the coast of Nova Scotia with the lobster fishery, or the, the indigenous peoples blocking the CGL pipeline in BC, the Wet'suwet'en, or the Shuswaps, the Kwetmuk, uh, blocking the Trans Mountain pipeline, there's reasons why there aren't agreements our agreements are being violated. And so you need to educate yourself on that and not be too judgmental when you see these conflicts occurring on the ground. Get into the background of what, what's behind them. Because the media doesn't, uh, doesn't cover it. They're, they do very superficial analysis on Because indigenous issues are complicated and reporters are basically lazy. So they don't want to dig into the, the history and the facts. And that's where academics come in. You know, there's a role to play of people in the universities to assist in the self-determination plans, the technical skills. Um, you know, the universities have a key role to play, I would say, in helping making sure the information management skills that communities, you know, need are being acquired and to help with the research capacities. These are things that you have within your power as individuals to do. So that's my words of wisdom is I encourage people associated with universities to, to help. Hi, I'm still in the Zoom meeting. I'll have to call you back. Well, thanks again for uh, for that. That's a good finishing remark, I think. Um, we all have our homework, so we know what we need to read and go research. And after this presentation, I have a thousand more questions. So uh, I definitely have some homework to do. So again, thank you so much for taking the time to not only have a great presentation, but a really excellent conversation, addressing a lot of our questions. Um, and thank you to all the participants for taking the time out of your busy day, spending time on Zoom when you might not want to, um, and listening to a really, um, important topic.
Um, so again, thank you to everyone. This video will be posted on the Indigenous Student Affairs YouTube channel. Uh, and there's lots of other presentations out there. So we want to keep these conversations going. And I hope that we could invite you again, uh, maybe next year and build on some of these questions and see where we're at, see where you're at in your, in your very important work. Yeah, uh, miigwech, uh, thank you. Merci. Have a good day, everybody.